Right, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Schubert seminar. Today we're happy to have uh, Slava Naprienko from uh, Stanford University uh, talking about so many sure functions. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and uh, indeed, I'm going to talk today about so many sure functions and how they appear everywhere in math. And uh, I want to talk about how to generalize some of the sure functions and why some generalizations are important. And uh, I guess the main topic and the main theme of my entire talk is going to be trying to address and answer this question. And the question is, what is, what is sure? Many of the functions, we feel that they deserve the name sure, and uh, many of these functions, they satisfy similar properties. But because they have different origin, they have uh, different uh, ways how you can look at them. So since the first part of the talk uh, is introductory, I'm going to talk about the classical family of the sure functions, how they appear and what property they satisfy. And then I'm going to go forward towards more general sure functions. So. The story began begins with the classical sure functions. Oops, sorry. The story begins with the classical sure functions, and uh, the classical sure functions, which are denoted by S lambda and parameterized by partitions, is is a symmetric function which happens in many, many different contexts. And probably the most important context for this seminar is the context of the um, uh, Schubert calculus. So if we look at the, um, at the Grassmannian, and uh, you can think of the infinite Grassmannian, you can th uh, think of the finite Grassmannian, and you look at the homology ring of the Grassmannian, it turns out that the cohomology ring is naturally is isomorphic to the ring of the symmetric functions. And moreover, the Schubert class in the cohomology ring exactly represented by the sure function. And uh, so this alone is already a very good reason to try to understand what sure functions are, because if we want to understand the combinatorics of the Grassmannian and being uh, able to answer all of the questions from enumerative combinatorics, we just want to understand what these sure functions are because just the Schubert classes are represented by the sure functions and they form the linear basis of the ring of the, of, of the cohomology ring. Another source of the sure functions is the representation theory. If you look at the representation theory of JLN or SN, the symmetric group, the general linear group, or the unitary group, you will find that the characters of uh, irreducible representations are also being equal to the sure functions. So in other words, if we look at the character of the irreducible representations, it turns out that irreducible representations, polynomial reducible representations are often uh, parameterized by partitions in these cases, and the characters are again equal to sure functions. So this is already two independent contexts where sure functions appear naturally, and uh, it gives a very good reason to try to understand them in detail. All right, um, probably some other reasons which I'm not going to address in detail in this talk is the fermion boson correspondence which uh, happens in the mathematical physics and uh, integrability. And uh, some of the um, others are um, enumerative combinatorics and so on. So many, there are many, many different reasons to look at the sure functions and try to understand the, the structure. So in particular, in the Schubert calculus, um, if you want to understand the multiplication on the uh, ring of the cohomology and then expand the product um, again in terms of the short functions, you will look at the um, constants which are called the uh, little with the Richardson coefficients and they play the important role. 
So this is some different context where we can find the sure functions in the wild. Some natural questions like Schubert calculus, the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, or some natural questions like the character of the reducible representations. So now I want to talk about how to actually study and how to actually write down sure functions, how to actually uh, express them, and um, where do these expressions come from? I want to talk about the expressions. And uh, so the first way how you can write down the sure functions is combinatorial. And uh, this is perhaps the easiest way how to do it. In fact, it is so easy that this is exactly what I always give to my students in uh, research experience for undergraduate students in the programs, because this is something you can give to anyone who doesn't know anything at all. And nevertheless, they can start feeling that there is some uh, deep fundamental structure. So if you want to describe the pure function, it turns out that it is just enough to look at the tableau which is just diagrams uh, parameterized by partitions, and you fill them with numbers, uh, which is called the semi-standard tableau. I'm not gonna go into detail because I want to talk a little bit of the big view and uh, talk about the different generalizations. But uh, roughly you look at the combinatorial data, you assign weight to each combinatorial data, oops, and then you sum over all of these things. As a result, you have very, very explicit expression for the sure function. It is so easy that you can give it to anyone who can write numbers in a table and uh, you can write them down explicitly. And uh, it is a very down to earth definition, but of course it has some drawbacks. And uh, one of the obvious drawbacks is from this definition, it's not even clear that the function is symmetric. If I give you some sum over all of these partitions and you look at all of these terms and sum them together, why would the sum be even symmetric? And uh, how do you understand any of the other properties uh, from the combinatorial sum? So it has some um, positive and negative sides. And uh, another definition, which is probably some of uh, the people learned um, first, I'm gonna call it a uh, whale formula. It is the definition of the sure function as the determinant. You can just give it explicitly as some determinant or rather as the ratio of two determinants. And uh, in the denominator, we have the uh, Wondermond. So I'm gonna just uh, write explicitly, explicitly the expression for the Wondermond. And uh, this, this definition is uh, great for other purposes. This definition is allowing you to see uh, the explicit expression for the sure functions in terms of the variables, but it has uh, another drawback. If you expand the determinant and look at the terms in the uh, expansion of the determinant, you have lots of sign cancellations. The first formula inherently just positive. You just write sure function, as its monomials, that's, that's every term that happens in the sure expansion. And uh, the formula because of that became, becomes extraordinary explicit and you just write sure function as one term plus another term and so on. And it is just a positive sum. On the other hand, this one is more obscure because now we don't understand the terms so well, but now we have the closed expression in terms of the determinant. The third one, which probably going to be the last one that I'm going to talk about is the definition in terms of determinant, or I'm gonna call it a Giambelli. So Giambelli definition is always the definition of the sure function in terms of the very same sure functions, but of smaller order. So in particular, uh, the Giambelli, some of the Giambelli S identities are given us the sure function in terms of the complete uh, symmetric polynomials, which could be given, for example, by generating series or just uh, ex uh, computed explicitly, or dually we have the expression in terms of the elementary symmetric functions. So this is three different ways how you can just write down the sure function, give it to someone and so that they could look at this. But uh, before, before I go further, I want to take a moment and uh, appreciate these uh, three definitions and uh, 
perhaps to think how non-trivial it is for someone who doesn't know anything about the sure functions near applications, why these three definitions would give you the same answer. If you look at these definitions, this is an explicit combinatorial sum from which it is not even clear that the resulting sum is going to be symmetric. Why would you write such a sum as the determinant with appropriate cancellations? And why would you be able to write the very same sum as the determinant in terms of the smaller uh, sure functions? And uh, is it which one is preferable? Which one is more natural and others are just uh, some some of the formulas that you can derive from uh, the, the first one. So this is a non-trivial question and uh, different authors take different approach. For example, Stanley in enumerative combinatorics in the second volume just uh, starts by defining the sure function as the combinatorial sum. And uh, he writes that the following uh, definition might be not motivated. Look at the sure function, it is just sum over some tableau. And uh, you just uh, write some weights uh, in a tableau and just enjoy your function, but you have no idea why would you do this. On the other hand, uh, the whale formula, um, this is uh, the approach taken by McDonald. Um, you can immediately see that it is the ratio of the anti-symmetric function by the symmetric function. And by some simple analysis, you immediately understand that it means that the function should be uh, symmetric. And uh, moreover, it is immediately clear that such functions form the linear basis of the, all of the symmetric functions. So this is a really good definition, but it has a drawback that it is not as explicit as uh, the expansion in terms of the determinant. And it turns out that this definition is very hard to generalize. It is very nice that for the sure functions, we have such a simple formula in terms of the determinant, but it turns out that for more complicated functions, there is no such simple uh, expressions. But meanwhile, the combinatorial expression or the expression in terms of the Jambelis formula is gonna generalize uh, better. Okay, uh, give me a second. So what we have at the moment is a family of sure functions, which appear in very natural contexts, like in Schubert calculus and representation theory. And there are different ways how you can see this sure function. So I want to say that these properties are in some sense are very fundamental and crucial. And uh, the further we're gonna go, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about generalizations we see that these properties extend to every other uh, sure family. So let me go to the second family. And um, again, the second family is having a very good relation to the topic of the seminar. The second family is our first generalization is the factorial sure functions. Which this time, um, I'm going to write the parameters here, which this time depends on a new set of parameters, on uh, new parameters A. And uh, how can you find these functions in the wild? What are they uh, living uh, their own life uh, in various parts of math? Well, so one of the uh, most important uh, findings is that these functions describe the, again, the Schubert calculus. So again, a very, very natural thing to do is when we consider our Grassmannian and we want to consider the Kahamova during, we find that the torus of the GLN is acting on the uh, Grassmannian in a very natural way uh, because it could just uh, act on the planes uh, by, by the torus. And uh, it turns out that you can extend the uh, cohomology theory. And uh, instead of computing the regular cohomology, you compute the uh, something called equivariant cohomology of Grassmannian, where T stands for the action of the torus. And it turns out that this more refined uh, version of the cohomology, so again, very natural thing. We just look at the Grassmannian with the action of the torus. It turns out that it is isomorphic to the factorial 
to the factorial symmetric functions, which um, I will uh, give you explicit uh, expressions for these functions in a moment. But of course, what is most important is that, again, the Schubert class is represented by the factorial Schur function. In other words, here is uh, the very natural origin for the factorial Schur functions. And uh, again, it gives the motivation to study their properties explicitly. In particular, the um, Richardson Littlewood coefficients, which were uh, studied in uh, many works of the uh, Sagan and uh, Molev, which was later used by Knudsen and uh, Tao to give uh, the combinatorial realization for the multiplication uh, in the uh, equivariant homology rings of the Grassmannians. So there's another very, very natural family of the functions. But now I want to uh, have an, uh, a question. Is there representation theory origin for such functions? Before we, oh, so, sorry, my, pen seems to be more functional. So before we saw that uh, the regular Schur functions, they appear both in the Schubert calculus and in representation theory. But now when we extend our definition to include the factorial Schur functions, there is a very natural extension to the Schubert calculus. Just look at the Grassmannian, but only with the action of the torus and look at the cohomology. Uh, but at least, uh, I don't know uh, what is the corresponding uh, extension of the theory of the representation theory, what kind of representations we want to consider such that their characters would be naturally represented by the factorial Schur functions. So we lost one of the motivations to study these functions, but it turned out that we found another one and uh, uh, somewhat irrelevant. And another motivation to look at these functions is the interpolation theory. Interpolation theory of symmetric functions um, was uh, developed by Sahi and uh, Akunkov and studied by Alshansky and uh, many other people. And uh, in, in, in short, the question is, if I have the symmetric function, I want to interpolate it. I want to expand it in terms of some of the some coefficients and uh, some bases. And it turns out that the factorial Schur functions form an extremely and extraordinary great basis for expansion of the symmetric function, uh, any symmetric function in this basis. And the reason is because of the factorial parameters, the, uh, the factorial Schur functions that satisfy some vanishing property that makes it, uh, that makes this theory uh, looks a lot like the the standard, the classical uh, Newton interpolation. I'm not going to go in detail about this, but what I want to point out is that now we have a new motivation, a new source where such functions appear naturally, in particular in Akunkov um, work, ah, I don't remember the year, uh, Akunkov classified all possible schemas for interpolations of the symmetric functions. If we want to interpolate symmetric functions and uh, have some sort of good properties for the interpolation nodes, what what could they be? And it turned out that in there is only three families that satisfy these good properties, and factorial Schur functions is just a natural family, one of them. In other words, it is another great uh, source and uh, inspiration and motivation to look at these functions, and. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the corresponding expressions and uh, whether they generalize nicely to the factorial Schur functions because uh, because we want to look at them uh, because they appear in all of these areas of math. All right. So if we're looking at the expressions, as before, we have the combinatorial expression. And the combinatorial expression is if you want to give the factorial Schur function, again, you can do it very easily. You, oh no, you, you can do it very easily. You again consider the, um, the semi standard tableau 
again fill it with numbers the very same way how we did before but this time we just uh, assign weights in a little bit more uh, refined way instead of just writing x1 we remember where the entry one occurred so if it occurred here i'm not going to explain uh, why we have uh, certain coefficients but we can write the corresponding weight where each term remembers where in the combinatorial data it occurred and uh, because of this um, it is perhaps something like this uh, because because uh, yeah and we do, do the summation of course, because of this, now we have the refinement, and uh, this definition gives us immediately uh, understanding that these uh, sure functions uh, very naturally generalize the regular ones. If you set all of the a's to be zero, then you're just gonna collect the very same weight that you were doing before. You don't have any of the equivalent parameters, and uh, you go back to the regular sure function. So it is... Uh, it, it corresponds exactly to the fact that if your torus um, acts trivially, then you are just considering the regular cohomology ring. Okay, so as you see, we still have the combinatorial expression for the factorial sure function. And, uh, and the combinatorial expression became a little bit more complicated, but still pretty easy. If we look at the whale formula, it turns out that it also generalizes very well. If you want to write the factorial sure function as the determinant, you can still write it as the ratio of the determinants. But this time, instead of just having the uh, variable x, we have the factorial power of uh, x, which is just some shifted version of the of the very same power. And uh, and then the formula is pretty much identical. We again um, divide by the Wandermont, and uh, our formula our determinant formula remains the same. Um, let me put it here, let me put it here. Okay, and uh, of course, the very same uh, way we extend the Giambelli definition. And uh, indeed, the, element, uh, the factorial um, sure functions could be given as the determinant in terms of the complete factorial sure, sure functions, which could be de defined by some simple generating uh, series or even explicitly, or dually we can uh, expand it uh, in terms of the elementary factorial sure functions. So you see the very same properties, they um, remained intact, but I want to point out that uh, there is something very interesting is happening and uh, probably this is how I'm gonna uh, make a break after I explain this. When we looked at the sure functions, at the original sure functions, these three definitions, the combinatorial, the whale formula, and the Giambelli, they come from different sources. So you can imagine that the combinatorial definition is really coming from the representation theory of GLN because you can think of the tableau as parametrization of the weights of an irreducible representation. So then it is very natural to write the sure function as the sum of all of the weights. And uh, it, it, makes, it makes the combinatorial formula very natural object. You just sum over uh, all of the weights in the irreducible representation, the character, and uh, that's how you get the, the combinatorial formula. On the other hand, Giambelli formula, for example, is naturally coming from places like sugar calculus, because the way how you can uh, find these uh, formulas is by considering the churn classes of the tautological bundle, uh, and uh, it is uh, it is very natural language to describe the the entire ring in terms of the complete uh, homogeneous functions or the elementary uh, uh, symmetric functions. In other words, uh, and the whale formula is coming from even another source, which probably could be called crystals and uh, some other structures, which I'm not uh, talking about. But what I want to point out is that the way why these definitions, three different definitions are natural, it's very different reasons. For example, 
the combinatorial definition in terms of the tableau in a way it doesn't make any sense in terms of in, in, in Schubert calculus because what each monomial even means we cannot expand if we if we look back here we see that uh, in our uh, identification the sure functions uh, represent the Schubert classes in the cohomology ring but if we want to expand the sure function in terms of the monomials, what could it even mean on the side of the cohomology ring? You, you probably could embed it into something bigger, but uh, it is not immediately and not immediately natural object because we don't have any space into which monomials would live naturally. But, uh, but in JLN, it is a very natural object. So what I want to say is that these definitions are coming from different places. And when we go to the factorial sure functions, Giambelli formula, again, could be thought to be coming from the Schubert calculus. But now we don't really understand what is the origin of this definition. What is the origin of this definition? Why this definition, as the combinatorial sum of the blow, is natural? Because as I pointed out before, it's not very clear what is the corresponding representation theory such that we would have some reducible representations and when we take their characters, we would get these factorial sure functions. We would love to have some theory where we would have thing like this, but as I understand, and uh, there is no such theory, at least we couldn't come up yet. And, uh, but nevertheless, a very similar formula that does a very similar job is there. And, uh, well, formula is having something very similar, similar connection to here if you describe the combinatorics of the representation theory. So in other words, we see that the sure functions, when you generalize them, and when you consider more general versions coming from different places, they still have these free properties, even if we don't know why. Even if we don't know why we have some of these properties, nevertheless, they do. And this is going to be the feature for the further generalization I'm going to talk about. And uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about the, the ultimate generalization. Oh, yeah, I see uh, there is a, in the chat. Yeah, yeah, you can embed it to the matrices and then there is monomial uh, uh, expansion. Uh, I, I guess that you need to embed uh, your symmetric uh, situation into something non-symmetric to see this monomial. Uh, but uh, I don't know if uh, there is a correspondence between the representation theory, because there is, there is this uh, result that connects the Schubert calculus and representation theory of JLN. You can show that these things, you know, they have some sort of uh, functorial uh, uh, connection. Meanwhile, in the in the case of the factorial sure functions, it is very natural to consider super calculus, but it's uh, not very clear what is the corresponding representation theory. Anyway, uh, I think that is going to be a uh, stop for me, and uh, we can take the break. Very good. Okay, so we'll take uh, a five-minute break.